Welcome to the Young Americans for Liberty policy discussion on evolving marijuana laws. Uh, today we're joined by two cannabis policy experts um, to join in on this conversation as we think about what happens moving forward. We've seen recent action by the, the White House and, and President Biden uh, moving forward with expunging or excuse me, pardoning and therefore expunging records for over 6,500 Americans who had been previously saddled with criminal records for simple marijuana possession. And keep in mind that this does not pardon those who were involved in trafficking or distribution. This is simply marijuana possession in and of itself. And that affects over 6,500 people, um, plus a number of others who are within Washington, D.C. Um, this is a, a great step in the right direction, considering the dismal failure of U.S. drug policy, in particular marijuana prohibition. We're finally starting to see them move in the right direction. And I appreciate the call for governors and state legislators to start thinking about how we can roll back the harm that's been caused by bad state law over the years, moving forward in a direction that makes sense to the vast majority of the American people who now understand the failures of prohibition and the need for a better approach on this issue. In addition to those pardons, he also instructed his administration to start looking at the Controlled Substances Act and reevaluating whether or not cannabis should be alongside heroin or should it be descheduled and regulated more similarly to alcohol or tobacco. Um, these are things that advocates have been talking about for years and is finally gaining traction at the federal level and hopefully at the state level as well. Uh, so I'm pleased to introduce our two speakers. Today we are joined by John Bauckham, who has been involved for about 10 years in cannabis, working and seeing how things have played out, being a part of uh, moving the ball forward in Texas, um, but also working with Republicans Against Marijuana Prohibition nationally, helping advocates in other states as well. Uh, the Re Republicans Against Marijuana Prohibition was established as a political caucus within the GOP that recognizes prohibition of marijuana to be a failed policy that undermines our liberties. Um, he's been involved again since 2012, and he served previously as the chairman of the Texas Young Republican Federation. Uh, we're also joined by Jeffrey Lawrence, who is the managing director of drug policy for the Reason Foundation. Uh, Jeff has broad experience as a financial executive in the public and private sectors and, and as, de as a, a uh, think tank analyst for over a decade. As CFO and chief compliance officer for the first fully reported publicly traded marijuana company uh, to be listed on the U.S. Stock Exchange, he oversaw all aspects of compliance with state and local laws and regulations for the licensed cultivation operations across two states. Prior to that, Lawrence served as a senior appointee to the Nevada State Comptroller's Office, where he oversaw external financial reporting covering nearly $10 billion in annual transactions on behalf of the state. Uh, Jeff spent a decade uh, developing market-based solutions, and I, I want to emphasize that um, because of how important it is to have libertarian uh, perspectives on these issues when we're talking about regulations and talking about moving away from prohibition. Um, so he worked to develop market-based solutions to, ch uh, to the challenges um, that are facing state governments while working with the Nevada Policy Research Institute and previously the John Locke Foundation in North Carolina. Uh, Jeff has also written for the Cato Institute and the Heritage Foundation with particular expertise in state budgets. Uh, welcome, gentlemen. So glad to have you here. Yeah, thanks, Heather. Thanks, Heather. Good to be here. Yes, absolutely. So let's just um, start right away with uh, talking about the federal action that was taken, what this does, what it doesn't do, and why it is important that this action was taken. Um, let's start with you, John. Uh, yeah, well, you know, first I just want to say thanks to you, Heather, and thanks to Young Americans for Liberty. When I graduated from UT in 2006, we didn't have a YAL chapter. So, uh, you know, I'm excited to see the work that you're doing, the work that some of the other students and other partners are doing for the organization as well on cannabis and many other types of issues as well. So I think, you know, regarding President Biden's executive action, anytime that cannabis is in the news, it, it always makes waves. I was actually in Puerto Rico and we had just landed and my friend that I was with like showed me the alert, you know, and so we're like, oh, well, what is this? Let's dig more into it. And you realize that it, uh, while it is impactful, it's a huge, I think, personal change of tune for the president, you know, especially compared to the days when he was in the um, But when you look more deeply into it, you know, it's an action that does 
far little, far too late. So I think it's a step in the right direction. Hopefully it'll drive conversations towards, you know, moving more uh, with the reclassification or rescheduling of cannabis at the federal level as maybe a secondary component of this, which would be great. But, you know, as we see cannabis sort of being a political football and, and maneuvered around typically by the Democrats to try to encourage, you know, the youth and millennials to get out and vote for those favorable policies, we've yet to see any any actions really taken from that rhetoric, specifically in the U.S. Senate, where we were kind of promised that we might have seen some of that already. So, you know, a slight step in the right direction, hopeful that it will maybe lead to additional federal changes, but, you know, a little bit cautious on my optimism of how quickly those things might move or how impactful this might be, you know, to that conversation. Uh, yeah, great question, Heather. Um, you know, it's uh, like John said, uh, I think that uh, the president's announcement was significant primarily because he was the primary sponsor of the 94 crime bill and um, represents a big personal change of heart for him. And in a statement, he kind of alluded to that, that, you know, I kind of discovered that this, this approach hasn't worked and so it's time to change our approach. Um, but, you know, like John said, the, the impact is fairly limited. Um, no one was currently serving, you know, federal prison time for simple possession. Um, so this only affects, you know, uh, affects a few thousand people, which is great. Uh, but uh, it was a federal misdemeanor, not a felony. Uh, so, um, you know, this wasn't an obstacle for uh, or a significant obstacle for a lot of the people who you know was carrying uh, were carrying those convictions. I think the biggest impact of his announcement, though, was uh, uh, the part where he talked of where where he said he would direct uh, you know HHS and the Attorney General to uh, reevaluate the classification status. So uh, the way Controlled Substances Act works is that the FDA and the DEA have to work in concert uh, in order to determine, uh, you know, how various substances are going to be classified according to their uh, combination of their medical value and uh, their propensity to create addiction. Uh, right. So those in Schedule One uh, include you know, heroin, LSD, marijuana currently, uh, and that classification means that it has no recognized medical value uh, by the relevant federal, federal agencies and a high uh, propensity for abuse. Uh, that ranges down to Schedule 5, which is basically uh, like anti-diarrheal medications. Um, so, you know, uh, it, it slides down pretty quickly, but uh, Schedule 2, for instance, includes things like fentanyl, uh, which kills about 150 people a day in the United States. Uh, but, the, you know, the agencies recognize it has a legitimate medical use. Uh, I think once, once that reclassification hearing goes underway, there's been such an accumulation of evidence uh, and prominent medical journals, including Journal of the American Medical, medical Association over the last several years, uh, that there's basically no way to argue anymore uh, that marijuana has no medical value. It's not to say that, you know, there aren't some uh, dangers to, you know, uh, to repeated mar uh, marijuana use, uh, especially for teenagers. But, um, you know, th those dangers are uh, kind of, uh, are a lot less significant uh, than the medical value that people can derive for them, especially if they have uh, you know, epilepsy or cellular spasticity, uh, other conditions like that. Um, so that part of the announcement says to me, with the government, with the president's backing, uh, that there's very likely over the next several years to be, uh, if not a descheduling, at least some rescheduling of cannabis into uh, a lower schedule that would allow, uh, at the least, a you know prescription system for medical patients. And I want to take this opportunity to talk about some federal legislation that you've been involved with. Um, the States Act is something that you were involved with drafting and is one of the uh, one of a number of proposals that Congress is looking at. Uh, what would this policy do and how is it different than the federal action that was just taken? Yeah, so the States Reform Act 
slightly different than the States Act. Uh, States Act was Cory Gardner's bill uh, in the Senate uh, several years ago. Uh, that, that was very simple, uh, like one page bill. The States Reform Act is sponsored by Nancy Mace from South Carolina. Uh, and has about six Republican co-sponsors at the moment. Um, we're actually working right now to get uh, another six Republican co-sponsors, and then we'll start bringing on some Democratic co-sponsors as well. Uh, but the, the contours of this bill is basically remove uh, cannabis from all scheduling under the Controlled Substances Act uh, and allow interstate commerce um, with a 3% federal excise tax on, um, you know, on, on cannabis transactions at the wholesale level. Uh, the point of the excise tax is basically just to pay for federal regulation uh, because all interstate transfers would be uh, monitored and regulated by the Department of Treasury, the same division that currently oversees interstate transfers of liquor. Uh, it's the Tax and Trade Bureau. Uh, so, you know, when can cannabis products leave one state's system that, you know, it's tracked and traced, uh, Treasury would assume possession of that inventory, oversee the, the shipment. Uh, states would not be allowed to seize marijuana that's traveling uh, between states on if it you know, if it's traveling on a federally funded highway, you know, that's, that's been an issue in, in some places. Uh, but states would still have the option then to uh, retain marijuana within their own state versions of the Controlled Substances Act. So they could, you know, any particular state could maintain prohibition if they want, which they can also do with alcohol currently. Uh, it's just none of them do anymore. Uh, and, and the states that want to have either medical markets or full adult use markets would also be able to do that uh, and you would be able to, you know, as a consumer or a retailer, you'd be able to purchase from at the wholesale level uh, products from across the nation. Uh, the other, you know, kind of final big component of the States Reform Act is that it would automatically expunge all federal cannabis convictions that are nonviolent. Uh, so not associated with, you know, uh, armed robbery or something like that. Uh, and not for individuals who, are associated with drug cartels uh, or have a, a DUI on federal property. Uh, so, you know, it's uh, in, in that respect, it's actually much more expansive uh, from an expungement aspect than either of the Democratic proposals, the Moore Act or Chuck Schumer's CAO. Uh, the, you know, it, it just, uh, it doesn't spend quite as much money or tax nearly as much as those other options do. Well, we like that, that's for sure. <laughs> Um, and John, can you speak to the, the importance of expunging records? Yeah, it's huge. I mean, as we all know, there are many collateral consequences that can follow you around after a drug conviction. So, you know, immediately afterwards, losing your driver's license, being able, unable to commute potentially to your job and other responsibilities, uh, you know, creating legal discrimination in housing, financial aid, other sectors of the economy where you can get frozen out, you know, from having something like this on your record. and it's something that we're seeing now, maybe where attitudes are shifting on cannabis. So even if you saw someone who did have a cannabis conviction, maybe it's not the worst uh, thing, but there could be other just, you know, as we see these blanket statements or, or blanket policies that kind of automatically filter you out. So if you're one of two good candidates for the position and you have a marijuana conviction and they don't, you know, that's uh, probably a big opportunity for you to lose that potential employment. So uh, it's a huge that any kind of, you know, as I said earlier, anything that we can get marijuana in the news and get people talking about policy and realizing that our current one is failed and needs to be reformed is great. Um, so, you know, having these types of, having the, uh, you know, the governors essentially follow the president's lead to do this at a state level would be great. You know, we have seen that in some states have legalized. And one thing that I thought was interesting looking at kind of the polling on President Biden's action was there was obviously broad support. I think 80% or so of Democrats in one political poll said that they were favorable towards it. But in that same poll, 57% of Republicans said that they were favorable of those actions too. And I wonder, you know, of the, the typical person who's reading this headline or taking this survey, how intimately familiar are they with where, you know, how far does this go? Do they think the president just legalized cannabis or that he has, you know, expunged even state level uh, offenses and things. And, and I would say that some of them probably do, because I don't think people are, are that into the nuance of it. 
And I would say that those numbers track pretty well with other polls that we see for decriminalization or legalization, you know, again, along those party lines. And while the Democrats are, you know, 80%, that's fantastic. But to see Republicans at 57%, uh, 50%, you know, 52%, we'll see that frequently in Texas looking at decriminalization or even legalization, where there are starting to be a majority of Republicans that do support these actions. So, you know, the politicians typically will follow behind their constituents. And we always hear that, you know, in the different uh, Capitol buildings is, well, I'm, where do my constituents stand on this issue? And the more that we can show that, you know, minds across America are open to these reforms and specifically in those more conservative areas to those more conservative representatives, that is a smart political decision for them. And they can back it up, you know, from a conservative philosophical point of view as well. So, you know, it's exciting to see the, the movement and, and uh, we'll see what comes of this if we do see more governors kind of falling in line. And I've seen some questions kind of in the chat about some of the, you know, the hemp derivatives and things like that. They're in places like Texas where we don't have an open legal cannabis market, but we do have this de facto, you know, hemp market that is allowing for products that can create the same levels of intoxication and things. So, uh, you know, maybe we'll get to some of those down the road here. Yeah, let's definitely make sure that we cover that because that is a complicated element that's still very much evolving at this moment. Um, and I just want to take a moment to note that a person doesn't need to condone the use of marijuana in order to recognize the failures of our current policies and to want to take steps forward. So even those who are apprehensive about, about the issue, they don't use it themselves. They wouldn't want their kids using it. Um, well, we also want to recognize we don't want anybody in jail for it either, and that those um, impacts are having far more harm um, than the use of marijuana in and of itself. Um, and so on that note, we've seen a, a growing movement for reform across the country. We've seen, I think we're sitting at 18 states that have it really embraced the 10th Amendment and outright rejected federal uh, marijuana prohibition entirely, opting for a, a state-regulated uh, program instead, and that's for adult use legalization, sometimes called uh, recreational use. Um, I prefer adult use. And, and then we have 37 states that have legalized it for medical patients who have a doctor who thinks it can benefit them um, in their, their lives or their quality of life. Um, and then a number of others who have decriminalized. Um, I want to know um, from both of you, what are your, um, what do you think is happening moving forward now that this has happened? What kind of changes are the states going to be making, or now that the ball is rolling on this, I should say, because this was a very beginning step of federal change. Um, but what does this open the door for when it comes to state level reform? Um, we can start with you and then back to Jeff. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, I think it's great, you know, and I think again, towards the polling, wherever we see the polling, we see large majorities of support for these types of reforms and those may look different in different areas. Um, so I think, you know, as we continue to watch the, my confidence is fully in the states and the people to make action at the local level, which we're seeing in Texas, where some uh, municipalities are deprioritizing law enforcement for cannabis uh, prosecutions and other district attorneys choosing to have diversion type programs or other means to keep, you know, simple marijuana cases out of the system. So I think as we see more of that, putting pressure on the state legislature in places like Texas, more states that are more broadly legalizing adult use, putting more pressure on the feds, uh, both medicinally as well. And Jeff alluded to it, you know, with, um, with the builder pushing is that there is going to be a lot of cross state integration as we move forward with this blossoming industry. And so looking for ways to, you know, get the government out of the way of that or to help with a gentle hand where they may need to uh, is going to be something that's going to become more actively part of the conversation, I think, as we move forward. We've already seen that a lot with some of the banking regulations, you know, causing these businesses to be large cash-based enterprises. And that doesn't always create the most safe environments or the most uh, business-friendly means to expand their uh, their opportunities and things. So I think we're going to continue to see, I think there's five states that have uh, legalization on the ballot this November. So I would you know be confident and hopeful for all of those. And so it'll be interesting to see as we start approaching a majority of the states. I think that would take us to, you know, 23 or 24. And, uh, you know, we kind of, again, like, are, are edging towards that tipping point. And once we can get maybe some states in the South or some more conservative states that kind of embrace that legalization front too, I think, again, you'll see more of those dominoes start to follow. So, uh, you know, Missouri might be a good example of that. And I know 
something with probably the people on this call, you know, as libertarians, there's a lot of things that where it's just never quite good enough. But one of the things in the federal bill is the excise tax. You know, folks like Thomas Massey have said they can't vote for this because it creates a new tax. And, um, you know, one is I think when you look at federal excise tax and how they're applied, the, the most obvious example is towards liquor and alcohol. And to think that cannabis would be legalized and regulated differently from that, I think, is a bit naive. So that might not be the hill to die on and, and kind of allow the feds uh, to have that tax to allow for, you know, the cross state regulation and, and hope that the entities on down the line in the taxing structure with every city and every county and every state that wants to add their tax on top of it, you know, then you very quickly come to an unworkable scenario where you have an illicit market like what we've seen in California, you know, many years in where it's still dominated, you know, by the illicit players in that market there. So something to watch out for, but a lot of reasons for us all to be confident. And, you know, I would just say that the best action that we can have is going to be at our local and our state levels and uh, trying to push that on up to the federal level as well. And then thanks, you know, to Jeff and people like him that uh, are crazy enough to get involved at the federal level with politics and trying to move that bill forward, you know, through the gauntlet, um, you know, of, of Congress is, is quite difficult and, and admirable. So hopefully we can get some movement there and, and get those bills maybe to the president's desk in the next term. Yeah, and Jeff, your perspective on how things are evolving, especially when it comes to uh, state policy responding uh, to changing federal laws. Yeah, so, um, you know, the federalism aspect of this issue as a libertarian really excites me. Uh, that's one of the reasons I initially got in the industry. As you, you don't see, you can't think of any other issue area where states are knowingly passing laws in direct conflict with federal law. Um, I, I think it's kind of a beautiful thing, right? Uh, and it's uh, early on that was driven almost entirely by the voters directly through the initiative process. Um, I think the first 12 states or so that legalized were all by initiative. Uh, and then, you know, after Illinois, uh, we've started to see state legislators that are now willing to take this up, uh, which I think it speaks, I think, highly to the um, public favorability because uh, you know, we know that the polling is way ahead of where um, you know, our elected leaders generally are on issues. But uh, you know, now the elected officials are feeling comfortable enough with the polling that they're willing to put their own necks out. Uh, so you know, we've had several states now, and uh, just this year, actually, in Virginia and New York, and uh, kind of a, a legislative referred measure in, in New Jersey uh, that, uh, that were enacted you know, uh, by, you know, through the traditional process. Uh, so um, you know, that, that in itself has been a big change over the last 10 years uh, going from initiative uh, to legislative processes. Uh, now with you know, the president giving at least some endorsement for change, um, I think that probably further opens the floodgates uh, for st particularly the states that have existing medical markets to now consider expanding that into an adult use market. Um, you know, I do, the political dynamics of uh, you know Democratic uh, administration at the federal level uh, trying to push uh, you know kind of deep red states is probably a little less clear. I think. Uh, so, you know, I, I don't know that this actually pushes uh, some, you know, states in the South, for instance, to, uh, to change their policies that quickly. But as you know, there, there is kind of a, a social phenomena where a, as people see that, you know, states do this and the sky doesn't fall, um, that, uh, you know, crime doesn't spike and that, you know, teenagers are not using it at any higher rate than they were before. Uh, that, that kind of shows people that you know, maybe this legalization approach uh, isn't that bad. And, and maybe you know, uh, the criminalization of this product for, that has a, a very wide demand uh, has spurred some crime, uh, particularly along the border states uh, where, the, where most of the smuggling occurs. Uh, and there's plenty of evidence to back that up. Uh, that uh, you know, the crime has in the legal states uh, that are far from the border, crime really, crime rates really haven't changed that much. But what we've seen is that 
as states across the country have legalized, the uh, violent crime rates along the border states uh, have decreased significantly. So, um, you know, I, I think those are great signs that programs are working. The, uh, John mentioned the variability of public poll uh, from place to place. I think uh, yeah, it, it, it does rem remain, you know, remarkably consistent depending, you know, regardless of which state you're polling, but uh, people, depending on how an initiative is drafted, uh, you know, it's the details that may turn some people off. Like there's, a, there's an initiative in Missouri right now, it's very controversial uh, because a lot of the proponents of legalization are opposing uh, the initiative uh, because it basically locks up the market for the existing medical licensees and no one would ever be able to compete. Uh, so, you know, we deal with those kind of cronyism elements in, uh, in states around the country, and certainly as libertarians, we want a fair and open market that, you know, offers pathways to entrepreneurship for, for new people. Well, and keeping up with that, that point about um, overly burdensome regulations and cronyism, because we are seeing um, the cannabis industry really going down the same path of corporatism as every other industry. Um, so how can we help to fend off some of that, um, especially for some of the state legislators that are, are, are tuning in and are interested in this? How do we help to institute reasonable regulations in a state, making sure we're keeping it out of the hands of kids, making sure that we're um, minimizing, if not eliminating, diversion, all those important regulations um, without overdoing it? Yeah, I think a couple of questions. I've just been kind of looking through the chat, you know, while Jeff was talking there and one from, I apologize if I get the name pronounced incorrectly, but Representative Sykes from Missouri, you know, kind of looking at it as a moral issue. And if we legalize cannabis, are we going to have more people who are wasting their life away, you know, in clouds of smoke and, and not being productive members of society or good members, you know, towards uh, their family and those kind of things in their community? And then another question was about testing for impairment while driving. And I know from you know a lot of my friends in conservative circles, that's something that they've raised even a long time ago. Is you know I'm maybe okay with this, but how do we create an objective, you know, scientifically accepted measure of impairment for someone that's driving behind the wheel? And you know, there's been some experiments with that, but I don't think there's anything that has really um, you know been generally accepted. So that's a big concern, and it's a huge issue. Driving while intoxicated under any drug to be you know, disastrous and something that, you know, I would say generally would be frowned upon. And as far as a moral moral issue, you know, I think there are already a lot of people right now that that's a similar argument that we get in Texas. You know, it's it sort of looked at as if you use cannabis, you must just be immoral. And I don't think that be, could be further from the truth because many moral people that you know are probably hiding their cannabis use because of fear of the consequences of getting busted with it, or sometimes maybe they're embarrassed to let their friends know. And I think that's something that that's funny, and maybe it's a bit of an anecdote, but when you've seen legal states, and now you have these groups of, you know, soccer moms or whoever they may be that are choosing to use cannabis instead of wine or instead of other cocktails that they might, you know, frequent at the bar, you're, um, you know, not seeing a, a degradation of society. Society, you know, to the representative's point, you can make an argument that society is going into the gutter, and there are many different reasons for that, uh, and drug use could play some role in that. But to specifically blame that on cannabis, you know, I think is a little bit unfair. And there are certainly many good people, you know, who choose to use a safer alternative for their, uh, you know, social enjoyment of cannabis rather than alcohol or, or other, you know, other things as well. Well, I'll, I'll add to that, that the, the harm of a criminal record is going to keep somebody from being productive in their community, providing for their family far more than using cannabis in and of itself. And frankly, it isn't the government's job to regulate morality. Um, that's a job of communities and families and churches. And it is important to talk about the line between substance use and abuse. And we have to take substance abuse much more seriously in this country than we have historically. Thankfully, we're finally starting to come around on that so we can have meaningful conversations about the people that do have substance abuse issues, which is a very small percentage of cannabis users, but there are some, and we have to look at that honestly and hit it head on so that we can make sure we give people the resources that they need to thrive. 
Um, but of course, saddling them with a criminal record is not going to do anything to getting them more productive and um, excelling in their lives. Um, and so kicking it over to you, Jeff, about regulation. So you talked a little bit about kind of cornering the market with licensing caps or regulating who can get a license in a particular state. What other kind of regulations have you seen that are overly burdensome that maybe states want to make sure that we avoid so we don't uh, lay it on too thick when it comes to, to legalizing in our states? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. I think you need to uh, provide the marketplace a pathway for creativity uh, and experimentation. Uh, some states, you know, I, I live in Nevada and uh, here in Nevada, the, you know, any product that a licensee wants to create or sell has to be pre-approved by the regulatory agency. And what I mean by that is not just the, uh, you know, extraction or infusion process or the, um, or the growing medium or, or any of that kind of stuff, but, uh, you know, any piece of equipment you want to use um, there's there's a lot of options out there. It needs to have uh, prior express written consent uh, from regulatory agency. Uh, all of the packaging yeah, down to every detail, including font size and colors, uh, needs to have prior approval uh, before it can be sold. Uh, that really hamstrings all of the market operators because the regulatory agency doesn't have that many people. They act slowly. Uh, it can take six months to get a new product uh, approved just because you put a new label on it. Uh, so, you know, that, that, that kind of structure uh, will leave your state behind when it comes to innovating in the market. And the market innovates very quickly. Uh, so, um, you know, some states, one of the things that California has done correctly is, is this particular issue. Um, they... <laughs> Uh, you know, they set out clear guidelines for what, you know, uh, the processes that you need to follow in your extraction uh, and, you know, what the packaging and labeling guidelines are. And it's up to the operator or licensee to comply with those guidelines. Now, if, if the regulators go into a shop and they do uh, and, and inspect the, the products that are there and they see that you're out of compliance, uh, then they will give you a cease and desist letter, uh, force you to pull all of those products out of the system, which are easily tracked because, you know, everything is tracked with uh, RFID tags by batch. Um, so it's, it's easy for the regulators to do that. And then they can sanction the, the licensee who is out of compliance. Uh, that kind of system uh, is just far more dynamic uh, than, than what we see in a, in a state like Nevada, for instance. Uh, the other big issue, uh, which you mentioned, Heather, is the... Uh, is licensing. Uh, Illinois is probably the worst state out there in terms of an adult use market uh, because it's a state with, uh, you know, well, comparing it to my state, Nevada, uh, they have about five times as many people uh, and they only have 30 cultivators that were allowed in the, uh, you know, when they first passed the bill. And each of those 30 cultivators is allowed a maximum of 100,000 square feet of canopy space. Uh, to grow products for, for a very large market. Uh, so that's a maximum of 3 million square feet of, of cultivation space. Uh, by contrast, in, in Nevada, where we have a fifth as many people, there are about 140 licensed cultivators uh, and no cap on, on the amount of space that they can, uh, that they can grow in. So, uh, and and th there's, no, there's not a glut of uh, of supply in the state either, although there are massive shortages in Illinois, and, and you can once you di dive into the details, you can start to see why. Uh, and you know, go a little further than that, I'd say that it's really not. Uh, even if there were a glut, it's not state government's job to regulate supply and demand. Uh, some states have tried to do that uh, and target their license caps or whatever to uh, whatever the they forecast demand to be. Um, those are things that the market figures out and we do it with gas stations and we do it with, uh, grocery stores. Uh, you know, the, the market determines how many, uh, of uh, how many suppliers and of what quality, uh, need to exist on the market. And, uh, we shouldn't guarantee that everyone, you know, everyone who starts a business is going to, uh, somehow be protected from failure or bankruptcy, 
uh, because they got into this entrepreneurial endeavor, endeavor, there should be risk involved. Yep, absolutely. And so we've talked about some of the pitfalls and things to avoid. Um, are there any states that are doing it right that are good examples for folks to look to? Uh, Jeff, for you first. Uh, yeah, I'll jump in first. Um, uh, we really like Michigan. Um, we, you know, Reason was uh, I, instrumental in writing a lot of the implementing rules there uh, once the initiative was passed. So uh, Michigan, like most states that were uh, where the market was created by initiative, had very few details uh, in the statute. Uh, so most of the details were uh, were done through the rulemaking process. Uh, it's a it's a state where they have a 15% retail excise tax, single level of taxation. Um, not, you know, most of the states out there have, are taxing at the wholesale level, uh, at the distribution level at, and at the retail level, uh, and it kind of pyramid, pyramids up and it's not transparent to the consumer. So it's a single level of taxation. There's no cap on licenses. Um, they, you know, it's, uh, you know, they don't have the kind of structures I talked about with, uh, in Nevada where they have this, you know, prior approval thing. Um, so it's, it's a very dynamic market. And I think, uh, you've seen that supply there has exploded very quickly. Uh, they've been pretty effective at eradicating the black market, uh, and, and prices, pr uh, prices have fallen as quality has increased. Uh, so, you know, now Michigan is one of the most affordable States at a retail level. And, uh, you know, that's, that's generally a good thing for, uh, yeah, for consumers and for uh, for crime, frankly, because you displace the black market actors uh, by uh, by kind of crashing the price down to uh, to you know uh, a, a highly competitive level. So that's the state we like. They they have had some proposals recently that would muck it up a little bit. Although fortunately, they have uh, decided not to enact them. You know, they uh, forced unionization or forced uh, uh, labor peace agreements uh, as a condition of licensure is a thing that's come up in some states. Uh, California does that. They were the first ones, and now other states are copying them. Uh, that was a proposal in Michigan. Fortunately, uh, I think Reason was pretty instrumental in getting that that defeated. Uh, so we've been able to protect the market that we like there. Yeah, it's interesting. I have an opportunity to travel around quite a bit for work, and so it's always you know when I go to a legal state, kind of checking out what does that environment look like and. Some it's very friendly and open and you feel like you're just walking into kind of a shop on the street. The other ones you feel like you're being checked into a prison for a visitation, you know, when you're kind of buzzed in, buzzed out and, and um, you know, contained in different rooms along the way. And some of that goes back to some of the conditions, maybe because they are cash run businesses and they are vulnerable to, uh, you know, robberies and those kind of things. But it's, uh, you know, anecdotally, it's exciting to see the, the market progressing in these different areas. And I was actually in Boston a couple of years ago and that's when the, they were having like the popcorn lung with the vaporizers and things. And so they basically eliminated all the vape cartridges. And that's typically what I would have if I was in, uh, you know, somewhere there. So you, you, your only options were either flour, which you couldn't smoke anywhere or these water soluble drops that you couldn't really measure the, the dosage. So, uh, so it ended up not, you know, really being, a uh, a great opportunity there. And I think in the Boston area, there was only sort of one dispensary that had a line wrapped around the building. And, uh, you know, you could see that demand clearly dictated more dispensaries, but for, you know, whatever reasons, political or other, they were, um, you know, not allowing them to, to really to, to thrive. And, and then other places like you're seeing, you know, in Oklahoma, which has kind of the wild west of a medical marijuana program, and many license holders, many growers, uh, you're getting to that sort of glut there where, uh, you know, what is the quality of the medicine that we're getting? And then what is the return on investment for the people who are trying to grow their businesses in those states? And, you know, the market will work those things out. And I think, as Jeff said, if the, you know, the regulators and the states can have kind of light-handed approaches, then you'll see those players sometimes consolidate or, um, you know, others fall off or start to dominate those markets. And then the consumers will be able to pick and choose you know, with their free will, um, which players are successful, which is kind of the opposite of what we have in Texas here. We have, you know, a medical program that has very uh, strict, uh, only three licenses given out, and only two companies that are actually up in production and not giving many options to the consumers for what types of products they have access to. So 
a lot of room for growth here, but exciting to see other states that are taking, you know, those kind of laboratories of democracy approaches and we're seeing uh, what works and what doesn't work. And hopefully, you know, states like Texas and others can, can learn from those mistakes. And this is another thing too, is once you sort of legalize it, it's not necessarily over because there's a lot of nuance that needs to be sorted out. And, uh, you know, one comment that the representative made and probably a little bit tongue in cheek was that if Biden and the left support it, it must be bad. And I think generally, you know, a lot of libertarians or Republicans might agree with, with uh, a large portion of that statement. But I think, you know, in this country, we've lost the ability to see the nuance or to look at compromise on complicated problems. So uh, I think on this issue, neither side is going to get exactly what they want. Uh, but certainly there's a better way forward than, than our current stance, especially at the federal level. Um, so, you know, as we kind of pointed to at the beginning of this conversation, where does this lead to possible rescheduling or descheduling. And that's really the best that we can hope for is to completely return this issue to the states. Uh, but then there again will be a level of involvement for the feds as states want to uh, you know, allow companies to work together across their borders. And if you're transporting across a state that is a, a prohibitionist state to another legal state, you know, how do those things work? And uh, so we have to stay involved even you know, after we get that short-term victory to stay you know, committed to the long term and make sure that this is a thriving and successful market going forward. You know, John, one thing that you mentioned, I think is important to, to uh, come back to is the, the vaping crisis that we all heard about a few years ago that was happening with that, that lung issue that people were developing. And it's important to note that the vast majority of those cases were coming from black market vape cartridges. Um, so this is illegal cannabis that people are using. And because it's not regulated, there's no way to trace exactly where it came from and hold those bad actors accountable. You can, however, when a consumer purchases a legal product, go back and initiate a recall process that could save countless lives. Um, and that's the benefit of regulation in this case in consumer protection and accountability for the industry. Um, so yeah, I want to... Yeah. Oh, Go ahead. I'll just add really quick, other that in a regulated system, those products would, it's very unlikely they would ever even make it to market because uh, there are testing requirements between the wholesaler and the retailer that the product must pass uh, for, for safety and compliance reasons. Uh, that's, you know, th that's why you don't see these contaminated products. It was a chemical called vitamin E acetate that uh, these black market dealers were putting into their products. Uh, you're just not going to find that in a legal retailer. And so um, coming back into the policy side of things and how things are progressing in different states, and ultimately I want to get to the legalization of hemp and the nuances there that have brought us products like uh, Delta-8, Delta-10, THC, um, these different uh, cannabinoids that are um, commonly used now, but we're not even really known about three or four years ago. Um, and, and so when it comes to reform, we've got federal reform happening. Ultimately, we'd like to see cannabis removed from the Controlled Substances Act entirely, leaving it to the states, like, the, like John was mentioning. Um, and then what can the states do? So first, there's the option to decriminalize, which is removing the criminal penalties for simple possession. Um, and that helps with not saddling people with criminal records. And you can go further to expunge records of those who were nonviolent offenders for simple marijuana possession is a great start um, for that. So that is one approach that is a very modest approach to it that'll do a lot of good uh, for a lot of people. Um, alternatively, you have establishing a medical cannabis program, which most states have already enacted, uh, but some have been holdouts. And so that would be carving out within your penal code, carving out protection for those who have a doctor's recommendation for medical cannabis. And that recommendation is what gives them access to dispensaries and allows them to purchase cannabis medicine that will improve their quality of life. Um, and then the third option is repealing prohibition entirely and instead instituting a system of regulation, ideally reasonable regulation that ensures consumer protection, hits all the marks that, that Jeff was talking about, and helps to avoid the downfalls of other states like California who've done it terribly. They were pioneers. It was almost 30 years ago now um, that they uh, legalized medical cannabis and since then just recently legalized adult use but they are so overly regulated, so overly taxed that they have black market cannabis shops operating brick and mortar 
who would rather pay the fine for being out of compliance than actually go through the process of complying with the law. And that is that only serves the black market and diversion and is not the approach that we want to take. And so we want to see, the, again, reasonable regulations that incentivize compliance, get people into the legal market, again, where there's accountability. Um, and so I want to now talk about the legalization of hemp because this happened a few years ago. Um, I'm going to kick it to John and then to Jeff um, to talk about the federal government legalizing hemp. But instead of legalizing the genetics of the plant that is known as hemp, that was for rope and fiber um, and all of those good things that hemp can make, they defined hemp as ca all cannabis that has 0.3% THC, one of the cannabinoids, the, and the, uh, it has the euphoric effect to it, 0.3% or lower THC, which opened up a lot of other cannabinoids and opportunities um, across the country, legalizing cannabis with the exception of THC. Um, John, what have been the impacts of that? And then Jeff, I'd like to hear your input as well. Uh, yeah, well, it's really profound. You know, I remember in 2014 at the Republican Party of Texas State Convention going up to Sid Miller, who's our current agriculture commissioner uh, at that time, was just moving into his, you know, fall election and advocating to hemp, industrial hemp, as another commodity for Texas farmers to grow. And he was really standoffish about it. If, if you've ever seen, he is basically the the cowboy cartoon character from The Simpsons <laughs> is the best way to describe him if, if you're not familiar, but uh, he looks like Texas when you see a photo of him. And you would think, yeah, by God, we're going to allow our farmers to grow whatever the hell they want and sell it wherever they want. Uh, but he was very you know, apathetic and, and really disinterested. And we continued you know, after he was elected to talk to him about this you know, thriving potential for this new agricultural commodity in Texas. And he really remained disinterested. But then when we finally saw the, uh, I guess it was 2018, the federal farm bill pass, then it was uh, a totally different story. And you saw, okay, now there is economic opportunity here around the cultivation of hemp and folks like the agricultural commissioner, Sid Miller, um, other industry and resource groups got on board and they crafted a bill to allow for industrial hemp in Texas. And just like the federal law that, that Heather referred to, it defined hemp in the same way as, you know, cannabis sativa L with 0.3% THC delta nine or less by weight. And at that time, nobody really thought anything about it. And then uh, lo and behold, when you bring, you know, hemp in by the bushel from Colorado and they start uh, isolating it and distilling it into different uh, cannabinoid compounds that exist in, in very you know minimal quantities in the natural plant, but then refining those into uh, edible products or vape cartridges for delta eight or delta 10 or HHC, and then realizing that these things have a, uh, you know, the, the euphoric effect as well. And so, you know, Heather and I joke that we've, for years and years, have just not even talked about legalization in Texas, have only talked about <clears throat> reducing criminal penalties, you know, like not arresting someone and not putting them in jail for possession. And now we basically have this de facto legal market for hemp derived THC products that, you know, might be large gummies that are Delta 9 THC by weight or they could be these uh, minor cannabinoids that are in other edibles or vape cartridges. And the thing that's really concerning there is, yeah, it's easily readily accessible, but again, it's totally unregulated. You have no idea the process. We have an idea from one of the, the manufacturers here in Houston, because we got to do a tour of their facility and kind of see the extraction process and the refinement and looking at their laboratory where they're testing different products and things. And it was really fascinating. And, you know, I'm highly confident that they're kind of following the rules and cleaning their equipment and taking care to do the proper testing, but, but they may not be. And there might be others who certainly aren't. And when you have these things available at every gas station, corner shop, you know, CBD store, you're really allowing for an opportunity where you do get something that a hot product gets into the market. And then maybe we have some really disastrous consequences that could have been avoided by having, you know, some some basic, basic safeguards on, you know, these products in this new industry. So I think, you know, kind of in closing there, Texas really has to consider as we move into our next legislative session, we meet every two years. So 2021 in January, uh, 2021, 2023 here, we'll begin a new legislative session. And they're really going to have to decide, like, do we regulate this, uh, these, these products or do we try to stuff this cat back in the bag, back in the bag, which will be nearly impossible? Or do they look forward and think about regulating all THC um, in a light-handed way? 
and realizing that they've sort of lost and there is no way to put this cat back in the bag. Uh, but you know, what we've seen historically is that is not gonna happen. They will fight to the death. And so we imagine that they're gonna come after trying to put the cat back in the bag with all of these various THC products that are readily available on the market. And you know, we'll have to see how much of an uproar that causes and if, uh, if we're able to, to stop them and make them move the other way. And Jeff, thoughts on yeah. legalization of hemp? Yeah, so um, you made a good point in the beginning, Heather, that uh, the way that hemp was defined is really arbitrary with this 0.3% cutoff, uh, but there's no way that uh, Congress could have specified some type of genetic uh, difference because uh, you know it's, it's the same plant, just like you can breed roses to be white or yellow or red, but they're all roses, right? Um, ca cannabis is the same way. Like you can breed it to have less or more of a particular cannabinoid, uh, but it's all the same plant. Uh, and that's kind of how they settled on this arbitrary threshold. Um, and you know, early on in the illegal hemp market, there was mostly interest was in CBD uh, because uh, you know, it does have some valid medical treatments that the FDA has uh, approved a, a pure CBD extract uh, for treatment of childhood epilepsy. It's called Epidolix. Um, and uh, it also has some anti-inflammatory uh, properties. So, you know, people with arth arthritis and things like that have found some relief uh, by using CBD. Uh, and early on, you know, as, you know, people started cultivating hemp, extracting CBD, uh, there was some initial, uh, some initial demand from people like Coca-Cola to create uh, CBD infused waters and beverages and things like that uh, to try to satisfy that demand. Uh, what really bound up the market was the fact that the FDA never acted to approve regulations that would allow CBD to be used as uh, an allowable food, food ingredient. Um, and that basically locked out that CBD market, right? So uh, all these people who had invested heavily in uh, hemp fields and hemp extraction equipment now had to figure out something else they were going to do with all this inventory they'd created uh, because the, the demand for CBD they thought was going to be there, uh, the FDA basically killed through inaction. Um, and uh, that's when people started experimenting and realized that they could uh, isomerize that CBD extract uh, and convert it into THC, which is uh, now... <laughs> Uh, so now you have THC uh, created from a plant that was intended to not have any appreciable amounts of THC, right? Um, and uh, the way that, uh, so, so the legality of that is a little bit murky because the way the Farm Bill uh, and the uh, DEA regs define uh, legal cannabinoids from hemp is that they cannot be synthetically derived. Uh, they have to be organic. Uh, well, there's some question about whether you can, when you convert CBD into THC, uh, what began as an organic compound, uh, but now you've modified it. Is that synthetic or not? We didn't create it in a lab, uh, so uh, which you could do and have a purely synthetic compound, uh, but this is like a modified organic compound and nobody, uh, uh, the courts haven't ruled on this, uh, so uh, nobody really knows if it if it qualifies. But in the meantime, uh, people are selling these, uh, you know, hemp derived modified THC compounds, um, and and states, frankly, have had a hard time uh, figuring out how they're going to deal with it because it is a federally legal product, we think. Um, but, you know, some states have created adult use cannabis markets and now it's a direct competitor that doesn't face the same tax burdens or regulatory structures. Uh, and so now we're seeing a handful of states uh, are trying to capture those Delta 10, Delta 8 extracts under their regulated cannabis programs. Um, and, and it's created a really big mess. Uh, but I think long term, it, it probably is a good thing for expansion of of state cannabis markets because states are realizing now that they can't prevent the sale of these items. So maybe they should stand up a regulatory system. I vote for that, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> um, just bringing this in, I mean, really it just makes sense to regulate THC as THC, just like we do with alcohol. 
um, because it does have an intoxicant. I don't know if intoxicating is the right effect, right word, because cannabis isn't a, a toxin to your body like alcohol is. Um, that we actually have cannabinoid receptors in our body um, naturally, and so it's it's something that actually works with our body. But setting that aside, from a regulatory perspective, it makes sense to lump that all in together. Um, and so obviously there's a ton to talk about on this issue and we could dive into a number of things, um, maybe on a future policy discussion. I wanna run through just a few of these questions, kind of a lightning round for you two, and hopefully we can end on time, but anybody who wants to stick around for additional questions after one, uh, we, can, we can of course do that. Um, so uh, what effect does cannabis have on an embryo or fetus in utero? Um, my understanding, and I welcome both of you to give input, is there's just not a lot of research on this. Um, what I would say is that you need to talk to your doctor if you're going to be using any kind of substances. I imagine it's safer than antidepressants or painkillers that people are regularly prescribed while they're pregnant. Um, but this is something that doc you need to talk to your doctor about. Um, and so, uh, John or Jeff, do either of y'all have any input on that? <clears throat> Yeah, well, I'll just start with saying, you know, I'm not a medical professional. So again, I would say heed the advice of your doctor. But, you know, as human beings with an endocannabinoid system, you have to wonder how it interacts with the body uh, just generally. And then, you know, when in pregnancy there, I've seen some studies that say it can potentially, you know, decrease the growth of the fetus or, you know, allow them to be uh, born prematurely or other things. And there are so many factors that go into a pregnancy and, uh, you know, the uh, I have two children, and, and so having gone through that process and seen all the things that can happen, um, certainly it, it's something that you would want to be aware of. And, and you know, uh, I think it leads to your thing of use versus abuse. And so I'd say there's probably not enough research. And that's going into another question there that was about impairment. And that's a huge issue. And there really is, um, you know, I'm sure there's research being done, but nothing really agreed upon. And that's going to be uh, a major thing you know, as we start having more cannabis users on the roads and um, needing to determine when exactly was somebody potentially impaired versus just having it in their system, um, you know, and that's a very difficult question to answer, so. Yeah, yeah, exactly, because somebody could have used cannabis two weeks ago and it's still showing up in their blood because of the way it metabolizes, but they're not under the influence at that moment at all. And there's a, it's difficult to make that distinction. Um, but I'll tell you that the companies that are developing the technology are racing to get it right because the first person to get it right that's quantifiable is going to have the business of every police department in the nation. Um, so they're racing to that. And I do want to note that there are already uh, sobriety tests and already are other indicators that law enforcement is already trained on because DUI is already illegal. It is it will is illegal to drive under the influence now, and under legalization, it will remain illegal to drive under the influence. Um, the question is in the nuances and what kind of technology can we develop to really prove it in court. Um, but law enforcement already has some of those tools at their disposal. Anything to add to that, Jeff? Uh, yeah. So I would say that you know on the DUI front. Uh, there's no evidence that DUIs have increased in legal states uh, for the simple fact that, you know, people who were going to consume and then drive were probably doing it before there was a legal and regulated market. Uh, so not much change there. Um, the only way that police can really uh, determine DUI is by having a trained drug recognition expert on site uh, to do an evaluation at this point. There's, there's no objective measure. Um, on the uh, in utero use, to my knowledge, there's not a lot of medical research on that to date. There is medical research on adolescent and teen use, uh, which shows that uh, you know uh, uh, repeated marijuana use for for those age groups can delay, not impede, but delay brain development. Um, so. Uh, definitely something to consider. There's, uh, you know, but some some kids have conditions that they might need treatment for. So there's uh, there's positives and negatives to weigh uh, in those situations. But you know, I, I would generally think that drinking drinking liquor is not a good idea uh, while you're pregnant. Uh, I certainly would think twice about using cannabis as well. Excellent point. And the final question here is about the workplace and enforcement and. Um, you know, it opens up the legal questions, like if you're not using, if you're not under the influence while you're on the job, should it matter that you used it last night or last week? 
Um, but at the same time, does a business not have the, the, the right to choose who they have working for them, um, including people that use substances that they may not agree with? Um, what are your thoughts on the, the workplace safety element of this as we move toward a legal market? We'll start with you, Jeff. Uh, so we always recommend that uh, lawmakers include a, um, a clause in their legalization statutes that protects the employer's ability to enforce a drug-free workplace if they choose to do so. Uh, employment is um, uh, with the freedom of association uh, elements, as well as the fact that you know some uh, some occupations have legitimate. Uh, you know, dangers associated with them or licensing issues uh, that could per, uh, restrict uh, that employer from, you know, employing a cannabis user. Uh, so, you know, we think those things are valid and you should be protected. John? Yeah, I would agree. You know, I think we have strong uh, protection for employers and their rights and choosing who they hire and potentially why they, you know, terminate the services of those individuals. And we saw a little bit of this play out in COVID, you know, where some people were requiring the vaccine, for instance, and some uh, employees, you know, uh, had no option but to choose not to work there anymore. And so I think that's something, you know, like Jeff said, some jobs uh, could be very dangerous potentially. And I know many of the people here, if they're familiar with cannabis, may say, I could fly a plane, no problem on cannabis. But when you have a few hundred passengers on board, you know, it, it kind of goes beyond that, right? So. Uh, certainly, employers should have the right and the ability to, you know, test individuals for using different substances and make their policies, you know, around when or if those things are acceptable. And it was interesting, and kind of an earlier question to that was asking about similar to the military, you know, we have, uh, obviously, as we know from a lot of our work with the veterans here in Texas and other places, you know, there's a strong culture of, um, you know, uh, alcohol use and potentially abuse as well. Um, but the effects of that can wear off maybe a, a, you know, a little bit more quickly or it's not tested uh, and lingering in the body as long. And so, you know, I think that's one of the things is, you know, to have a, a military force, which is smoking pot and being docile, you know, is not going to be prepared to just run off to the next war that you march them into. So, you know, I think that's one of the reasons why, obviously, that they have kept it trying out of the military. But where we have seen the benefits and, and even with athletes, you know, being able to have a better recovery of their muscles and other things to really use it as medicine. And certainly there should be some, you know, permissibility for folks in the armed services to be able to utilize it either recreationally or, or medically as well. Um, you know, but again, with certain standards being set. I just saw that the, um, the official CBD of MLB is Charlotte's Web. Um, the uh, the Major League Baseball League has a has an official CBD brand now that they they work with with their their uh, athletes. So interesting how times are changing. That's for sure. Um, I want to offer you two an opportunity for any final comments. I'll go first here since I'm off mute. I just want to thank everybody for their time. You know, thank you Heather for setting this up. I think it's an important conversation. Appreciate all of the you know, activists, students, legislators, candidates that joined on here as well to be part of the conversation. And as you saw, just from a, a short meeting, there's a lot of thought-provoking discussions. And as Heather mentioned, we could be here all day kind of meandering down the different paths that this could take us. And what I will say too, to anyone that wants to see reform is to keep pushing, you know, meet with your state representative, your state senator, your U.S. congressman, your U.S. senator, uh, email them, call them, get in front of them every opportunity you can find uh, a YAL chapter or other, you know, liberty or cannabis focused groups in your areas and be part of the change. And, you know, an individual really can have a positive influence and impact policy definitely at the local and state level. Uh, and if enough of us keep pushing, hopefully we'll see changes at the federal level as well. Yeah, I'll be quick. I'll just say the 10th Amendment is real and it restricts the federal government from uh, acting on issue areas that are basically not included in Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution uh, and regulating uh, people's personal decisions to uh, to imbibe with a naturally occurring plant that kind of grows freely across North America uh, just doesn't fall within the scope of what the federal government should be doing. Yeah, here, here. 
Uh, well, I appreciate everyone uh, joining here today. We will continue the conversation as we move forward, it, uh, working uh, to adjust as the federal laws are changing and instituting state laws, regardless of the federal law, so that we can implement policies that work for our states when it comes to respecting individual rights, personal responsibility, and our values of free enterprise. Um, thanks for joining today.